We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. And uh, we did 2 Timothy chapter 1, first service. We did chapter 2, the second service. And now we're going to land in chapter 3, uh, this service. You guys are going to have to do chapter 4 on your own. Um, Because I don't have another service, you know, to do it in. Um, So when Paul writes this book, Paul is in prison. And so it kind of has this kind of sad kind of part of the book. You know, it's kind of like a sad book. I mean, what if I was writing you guys in prison and I was like, hey, you know, this is Bo. How you doing? You know, writing, writing about things. But I would write what's most important, probably, right? And, and so 2 Timothy is a book that is really what's most important from Timothy to relay to his protege, Timothy. And Timothy is in Ephesus, and he was a minister in Ephesus, and we have a book in the New Testament called The Letter to the Ephesians, and that's where Timothy was a minister at. And within that church, there was a lot of difficulties as well. Timothy was a young pastor, and he felt very, sometimes inadequate, and he felt very cowardly. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way in your Christian life, very cowardly, but but. Timothy feels this way. So Paul says, hey, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. He's encouraging in the book. Timothy, don't give up. Especially don't give up just because me, your mentor, is in prison. And people are looking bad on Christianity. And he says, hey, even though I'm chained, the word of God is not chained. And that's something always to remember. Paul says, though I might be in prison, the word of God is not in prison. And and even though it might seem like the culture is kind of down on Christianity, Paul says, guess what, dude? Christianity is going to go, man. God's going to do his work. Isn't that exciting for us in our culture? Yeah, even though people might have a, you know, be kind of dour and sour and just like, oh, you're a Christian, you're part of the evil or whatever it is that they say, right? You know, we have to realize that nothing is new under the sun. Just as in Paul's day, the ruling power was against Christianity, so who knows that we might live in a day and age at one point where once again, the power structure that is might not be for Christianity once again. That might truly happen. But Paul encourages Timothy and says, keep going just because I'm in jail. Keep going, man. God's word will still make its impact. And that's a faith statement, by the way, right? It's a lot of faith there, trust in God. And I really, when I think about this book too, I think, I, I kind of addressed it uh, as in a title as, you know, notes to the student, you know, notes to Timothy. He's the student. Notes from the, the master, if you will, to the student. And I really have in mind you students out there, you students that are going back to school, and the things that students need to know and learn and and. And so Paul says, hey, the things that you've heard from me, I want you to hold fast to that. And that's important. Young people need to listen to people that have been there. It's kind of weird, but we live in a culture where young people can simply hang out with young people all the time now. It's kind of a new part of our world. Now, nothing's wrong with young people hanging out with young people. That's cool. I mean, I was king of my prom. I was a friendly guy. I love hanging out with my people, you know? But there's something I learned when I became a Christian when I was 17, 18 years old. Me and my wife both learned this. And that is it's good to hang out with 20-year-olds, but you know what? They don't know much. (laughs) And we knew that. And if you're a teenager and you just hang out with teenagers, guess what? You got to know that too. 
teenagers, you hang out, might know some things, but man, we're teenagers. We don't know nothing. You know, we're 20-year-olds. We don't, we bear, we've only lived 20 years on the planet. And Paul's point is that you need to have a mentor in your life. You need to have someone who's, you're getting information from, you're getting taught. And that's a challenge for us that are older, that we need to be in the lives of young people as well. We can't just be with our own group. We have to learn how to invest in the younger people. And the younger people need to learn, especially when they're in university, they need to learn that everything that they need is not going to revolve all the in that university. That they need to have people that are outside of that university to help them through the the city that they're in, the paradigm that they're in, the ideologies that are being taught within that university. And it's important that we, as Christians that have been Christians for a while, that we take up the mantle and we feed in and teach. So Paul now continues in this book. I hope I've given you a little bit about what the book is about. And so it's his last book, that we read, and I'm going to pick it up just and read verses 24 of chapter 2 and then roll into chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a doozy, by the way. So chapter 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. So you must not be quarrelsome, but must be gentle, patient teachers of those who do wrong. In meekness, it says, instructing those who are doing wrong. Notice, be patient, be gentle. Doesn't say for us to be brash, harsh, right? Nothing's wrong with opposing the culture. And students need to know that. Nothing's wrong with opposing your culture. I loved going to university. When I went to university, it was fun because I just became a Christian before I went into university. Just gave my life to Christ. And coming from my background, I came from a, you know, a background where I was raised in socialism and progressivism. And that's how I was raised. So when I went, when I went into university culture, I felt like I was going into like my home, like that's my life. That was like, they were teaching stuff that I grew up already learning, already knowing. But it was fun to now go in there and as a Christian and be like, that doesn't make sense. I don't think, I don't think they know what they're talking about. Like when that professor just talked about the Bible being lame or bad. And when they quoted that passage, they, I don't think they know what that means. It doesn't sound like he actually knows it. I wonder if he doesn't. Or when the professor says, hey, there's no such thing as truth, I was able to say, well, is that true? You know, what you just said, because that makes no sense. You know, do you even know what you're saying? And it was really fun to be able to challenge that. See, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't just want to roll over. Right? You don't just want to listen to what they're giving you. And coming from my background and going into university, I already knew the lingo. You think CRT is new? Critical race theory? Social justice theory? I think all that's new. It's just a rehash of stuff that's already been around for a long period of time. This stuff I was trained on and taught on. It was fun to get in there and kind of go, hey, but you be gentle. Notice it says be gentle. We must be gentle and love when we're doing it. Care for people. And it says that in meekness instructing, blessing, blessed are the meek, right? They shall inherit the earth, Jesus said. In meekness, strength under control. That's what meekness is. Strength under control, man. You, you're strong. You understand what's going on, but you're, you're in control. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves and And then it says, perhaps God will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. Now, this is a big word and an important one that we're going to go into is the idea of repentance. The idea of moving towards God. Because now the scriptures teach something that's really interesting. 
See, some people say that in, like, as Christianity goes, things are just going to get better and better and better. You know, there's people that teach that. That, man, Christianity is just going to take over the world. It's going to get so good and everything's going to be great. Well, I hate to tell you this, but let's read chapter 3, verse (laughs) 1. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. So let me just stop right there. It says that in the latter days, and the Bible paints these pictures of the last days. It's kind of interesting, but your Bible is very prophetic. It speaks of a lot of future events. One of the main events that was spoken of in the future was the coming of Jesus. That was spoken of thousands of years before Jesus came on the scene. Well, another event that is coming is called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible speaks of that a lot as well. And so when it speaks of latter days, it's, Paul has in mind this kind of prophetic, apocalyptic kind of you know, situation, this future situation, this unveiling of the end. And he says, perilous times will come. And a lot of young people don't like to hear that, of course, because you ask young people, hey, are you ready for the end? And they go, no, I want to live. You know, I want to get married. I want to have kids. And they don't, you know, they don't want to hear that. Now, the older that you get, the more you're like, right on. <laughs> right? The older you get, you're like, bring it on, man. Let's go. Let's go be with the Lord. You know, that kind of idea. So you can kind of tell where people are at, usually age-wise, by how they relate to this passage. But it says perilous times will come. So let's not be shocked by that, right? Let's not be amazed by the overall lack of repentance or a lack of mind change of the culture. The Bible's teaching that in the last days, the culture will be a culture that does not want to repent, So in the book of Revelation, when these amazing apocalyptic judgments are taking place in the book, this book of Revelation, you've heard of it, right? The last book of the Bible. When you see this, you think people would be like, man, I'm going to repent. I'm going to get right. But people's hearts are so hard that they literally cry out for the rocks, the mountains to fall on them. They literally will not repent. It's amazing. What does it say? It says that hearts, our hearts as human beings are super stubborn. We are a stubborn species. Now, it says this. For human beings shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. I'll, I'll share what that is. Despise or fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So I'm going to read from a paraphrased version just to get another idea of what this, these passages, what these, what this is talking about. People will love only themselves and their money. They will be proud and boastful, sneering at God, Already, there's a lot there, right? It says, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. They will be constant liars and troublemakers and will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to do good. Now, there's a word that it's describing here. And it's a word that used to be actually considered a bad behavior. Like if you had this, like you would go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they would diagnose you with this. And the word's narcissist. 
And that used to be a bad thing. Like, even just a few years ago, by the way, if you went to see one of these professionals and they sat you down and you said, hey, I'm about me. And you said, well, how much are you about you? Well, everything's about me. It's about what I think, my identity, my this, I'm who I think I am. It doesn't matter what you think. Well, can I share with you truth? No, no, it's what I think. What I think is right. That person would have been diagnosed a narcissist. It wouldn't have been a great diagnosis. Okay? But today, this is actually a praised position. And this is what Paul is saying, is that in the latter days, narcissism would be literally a praised position. If you are a narcissist, you are awesome. And when you're in junior high, you're a narcissist. Hate to tell you. But when you're in junior high, a lot of us junior hires, man, we're like, everything's about us. Like, if you don't listen to the music I listen to, then you're lame. That's how it was. If you didn't have a cool metal shirt on back in my day, Metallica tour shirt, Ozzy Osbourne, you know, shirt, you were one of those people. You know, we tried to be the oppressors and everybody else was the oppressed. And that's, and that's what, and that was, and that was how we were, lived in junior high. We grew up in high school. Everybody was in groups. You know, you certainly didn't want to be a part of that group. You had little names for them over there. You know, you put people down. That's kind of how I was in my world out in Southern California. And by the way, we've just grown up. All of my age has grown up, and we've just taken everything we learned in junior high, and we, like, have glorified it in every area of the world. It's absolutely astounding to me that when I look at today's politics and things of, uh, that are in our world, it just reminds me of my junior high world. It's like, and I, I, I fault my age. Sorry, I think our, us Generation Xers really biffed it. <laughs> we just didn't get past junior high. But this is what we've become. Now, people don't want to change from this because they don't want to repent. Because to repent means to literally say that I'm wrong. And when your culture's saying that no one can challenge your identity, then guess what? No one can challenge your identity. You're, you're unable to repent now because what is most valued in the culture is what you think about yourself. That's what people are telling you. See, back in the day, if you thought something of yourself, someone could come up to you and say, hey, dude, that's wrong. Like, that's not right. But now what is praised is that you think that way about yourself. I think I'm a dweeb. Well, cool, man. That's the way you think about yourself. That's awesome. That's so great. And that's you. You be you and you do you good. You know, well, this is how I identify. Right on. That's how you identify. It's great. You just keep going. Keep doing it. Keep doing your thing. See, it's all about you. Everything is about the individual and what they want. And Paul, doesn't he just nail it? In the last days, perilous times will come. People will be lovers of themselves. They will be so into themselves. Everything will be about them. My body, my this, my, everything is about them my money, my possessions, getting everything that you want out of, the li- out of life at the expense of others. It doesn't matter how it affects others as long as you get your way. People will be lovers of themselves and of their money, sneering at God People in the last days will be people that look to the things of God and look at it in disgust. They will say, how stupid is that? They will sneer. They will mock. You students have to be ready for that, by the way. You Christian students need to be aware of that. When you go into school, you should be prepared 
to meet that kind of pushback onto Christianity. People will sneer at God. They will be disobedient to their parents. There will be a utmost in the latter days, a movement of disobedience to parents. Not wanting to listen to anybody older. Young people will want to listen to young people. They will get their education from young people. Today they do that. It's called what? You too. They can get on it and all they listen to is people their age. And they think those people their age know what they're talking about. But they haven't lived enough life. They don't know what they're doing either. Any more than the person who's watching it knows what they're doing. There's no perspective anymore. It says they're ungrateful to their parents. And that's what it means, by the way, without natural affection. It means that they're not, they don't have the natural affection towards their parents. They want to detach from their parents. They don't want anything to do with parents. They want to throw off any parental authority. And does that not happen today? On massive levels, in ways that we never thought would ever happen, where kids are growing up and in this narcissism so much where they're identifying a certain way that their parents don't even understand what they're talking about. Their parents can't even, can't even grab what the, ch- what the kid is saying. The kid is saying, hey, I believe I'm this. And the parent's going, well, what are you talking about? You're that. Like, I know you you grew up with us. And they're like, "Uh uh-uh. Like, I know we grew up with you, but man, I'm I'm something else. And and there's a rift. There's these huge splits. Don't want to listen to the parents. Says they're hard-headed and never give in to others. You can't talk to them because they don't want to listen to anybody. You know, and that's, that sounds a lot like today, don't you think? Now, this certainly has happened in all times in the world. But I think we can all agree that the times that we live in, this idea of narcissism or it's like an entitlement is on another level. And this is something that, you know, for me, it's like, see, the last thing I wanted was my, I want, I didn't want, I I didn't want my answers to problems. I knew what my answers to problems was. And see, when you're in university, a lot of times what happens is you want to rebel. You are, you're young and you want to rebel. You want to do your own thing. You don't want to listen to people, uh, to authority. So what you do is you find people that will share the things you want to hear. And this happens at university all the time, by the way, at school. You know, you want to do drugs, so you go hang out with people who what? Do drugs. You don't want to go party, so you hang out with people who what? Go party. You want to be a part of a different ideology, a different way of thinking, so you hang out with people who think differently, those kind of things. So notice what Paul says here. He says, these people have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. And another translation could say, these people are people that they go to church, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Right? They're there, but they they, they don't want any of it. And Paul says, turn away from such people. And the reason why turn away from them, because if people will not take correction, if I will not take correction, then I can't be corrected. Does that make sense? If I will not take correction, if I won't say, you know what, that's true. I need to listen to that. Thank you for sharing that. If if people nowadays will not take correction, 
then what's the, uh, how can I even dialogue with them? Because they're not going to take correction. Everything I say to them, which is in opposition to their view, they're going to see as the enemy. Because in their world, to oppose is to oppress. To oppose them is to oppress them. And that's a, that's, that's a no-win situation right there. And so Paul says, hey, in the latter days, there's going to be a form of godliness. People are going to be there, but they certainly aren't going to be there. They're not going to be wanting to repent of their deeds. And what repentance is, is this. It's not that you don't struggle with the sins of the flesh. That's not what I'm talking about. Everybody here on the uh, social media that are listening to this, every one of us struggles with stuff. But it's not calling the spade a spade, man. It's not calling the thing a thing. Does that make sense? It's not saying this is what it is. The Bible says, the word of God says this is wrong, and I'm going to line up with that. I'm going to line up that it is wrong. See, Timothy's having to deal with people that are saying, hey, it's okay to be this way, and you cannot tell me otherwise. It's okay to be this way. See, there's no repentance in that heart. There's no repentance in the heart that says, this is okay to be the way I am, to, to like the things I like to do, to do the things I want to do. It's okay. God loves that. God's for that. That is not what the Bible's teaching. The Bible says that we must turn from our sinful behavior. And that sounds good. Just think if we lived in a world. Now, if you want a world that doesn't turn at all, doesn't change at all, then you're asking to join a baseball team where, you know, you don't know how to hit a ball, but the coach can't coach you because it might be oppressive to coach you. It might be seen as very bad to tell you that you don't know how to hit a ball. And so when the coach comes up to you and says, hey, this is how you hold the bat, And, you know, this is how you swing, you know, this kind of thing. You got to have this movement, you know. And if, you you know, and and if the, if the, if the, if you were getting taught and you looked at the coach and said, I'm very offended that you will not let me hit the way I identify to hit the ball. Right? I mean, this is what we're asking for, is this kind of thing. And Paul says, no, that's not how we live the Christian life. The Christian life is one where we admit the things that are wrong. We have to admit where we are narcissistic. We have to admit when we have covetousness that takes over our lives and goes, yes, I am being covetousness. See, we must be able to know the straight, which is God, so that we know what is crooked. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you don't know what the straight is, what a straight stick is, then you'll never know what crooked is. You can only know what's crooked if you've got a straight, something to compare it with. And the Bible says that God is the straight, and you cannot compromise the character or the nature of God. And that we are to look to the straight as good, and not say to the straight, you become crooked. And so what Paul gets into is this idea of listening to people. What happens in our life, and what I certainly did, is I wanted to listen to people who would tell me just what I wanted to hear so I can go hang out with them. Why? Because I wanted to do my own thing. I didn't want to listen to anybody. Now notice what it says in verse 6. For of this sort are those which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with driven lusts. 
ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what Paul says is this rebellious attitude of the student, of the one who wants to be a teacher, will move away from the things of God and he will find or she will find people that it says are gullible, that will that are burdened by their sin. And when you're burdened by your sin, you can do two things. You can say, you know what, man, I need to change my life. I'm burdened by my sin. You know, I need to change. Or you could just go, I need to find people that will accept me for who I am. Sound familiar? Just accept me for who I am. But the problem with that philosophy is, can you accept everybody for who they are? I've been jumped twice. Do you just accept that? Do you just go, hey, thanks for beating on me, man. That's awesome. You know, do you accept everybody for who they are? You know, when someone gets raped, do you just go, oh, that's, hey, man, we got to accept that. It's okay. See, it doesn't work, right? But that's the sinful nature. The sinful nature wants to latch a hold. It does not want the things of God. It does not want the things of God. It neglects the things of God. It will refuse the things of God. It will harden its heart and go its own direction and want to hold on to and find other people that are right there with you. And you know what? This is why it's important what Paul's saying to Timothy because he's saying, hey, Timothy, hold fast to the things that I've taught you. And the thing is, is if you are in the church you, I hope you're in a church where you are convicted by the scriptures. Meaning, if you're in a church where everything you're reading, you're going, man, I'm good. Man, I'm good. Man, I'm good. Then you're not probably in the right church. Because as we go through these scriptures, there should be something in there that goes, hmm. Because the Bible tells us that we are in a battle as Christians. Our flesh wages war against the spirit, and the spirit wages war against the flesh. And so there should be something that hits you when you're in the audience or when I'm reading these passages myself. There would be something that uh, when I read it, I go, whoa, man, that, that kind of hits the heart. You know, that's kind of convicting. Don't, the point is, is don't run away from conviction. Don't run away from different opposing what God's saying to your heart or saying into your life or speaking into your life. Again, too many young university students just go to university and they just hang out with their own peers and they don't have any competing ideas with them to challenge them. They don't have people that are with them really, you know, you know laying out truth to them. They just become part of the, the herd, if you will. And you know what? The word of God should be that thing that convicts us. Let's jump ahead to verse 16. Notice what it says here. The whole Bible was given to us. This is in the Living Bible. The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration of God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do every, or to do good to everyone. Now we, uh, a lot of us who know the King James Version, we've heard it this way. All scripture, our scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is useful or profitable for doctrine reproof. The idea of reproof is correction. So what Paul's saying is, young people, don't move away from things that the scriptures that convict you in your life. When you go back to school and all of our young kids are going back to school right now. And so that's what's on my heart. Is they're going to be in their own little cities hearing their teachers that have all the influence in their world. And Paul says, Hey, don't forget the correction that is there in the scriptures for you. When you're young, you, you, you want to feel the tension between what you're doing and what you ought to do. 
when you, you should feel the tension between what you're doing or what you want to do and what you ought to do. Not just when you're young, right? But any age in your life. If you don't have that conviction, then you probably aren't a Christian. Can I just be real plain with you? If you don't have that tension, then you might not know Jesus Christ. You might not be a a child of God yet. Because all you know is your own flesh and your own narcissism. That's all you know. That's that's where you're at. And I've been there. I've no, I know what that's like, where you're just living in it. You don't know any different. And the Bible tells us that if that's the situation, that it's that to cry out to God. To cry out to God, to ask for a revelation, to ask that he would speak to you, that he would touch you, that he would move you away from the danger zone. You know, narcissism isn't the funnest thing to do and to be. And this is what Jesus has come to do. He's come to make us lovers of people. He's come to take lives, and instead of us living for ourselves, yeah, I could have done what I wanted to do, but all of a sudden I started having a heart for people. And that's what God wants to do is make us into lovers of people. And this is what Jesus has come to do. Through faith and love, he's come to make us lovers. So Paul says to Timothy, hey, hold fast to the word. And if there's anything I could tell a student to, is just make sure that while you're at school and you're listening to whoever you're listening to, you're comparing everything you're listening to to the things which you know in the scripture. Always compare it to what it says in the Bible. You know, love people in your school. Have compassion on people in your school. Listen to their views. Listen to what they're thinking how they're thinking, why they're thinking those things, and then share with them the good news. Share them with what Jesus come to do for them. It's the greatest message of them all, that you can have eternal life freely. Pretty intense passage, right? Perilous times will come in the end. Don't be surprised if you see a lot of narcissism. It's going to be in our culture. But we as Christians, we have a future hope. We as, have, as Christians can love on people. We can care for people. We can go against that grain, you know, which is real punk rock, right? Going against it. You know, we can kind of all become Christian, you know, rockers in that sense of the term. Go against the grain. Follow Christ in that kind of way. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your word. There's so much to go over and we pray that you would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And I want to pray for all the young people that are going back to school. And I, and I thank you that we can do this as a church, whether online or here in person, that we could lift up all the students and pray for them and ask that you would be with them and help them to know your word. Uh, Father, I pray that they would grow in understanding your word so that when they are taught something different, that, uh, Lord, they would have a conviction. Or when they're doing something different, Lord, you would put a conviction on their heart. Lord, I pray that you would turn the hard-hearted towards you, that you would open up the eyes of the blind. And those that are starving, Father, for truth, I pray that they would find truth in you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your word declares that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whoever would believe in you but would not perish but have everlasting life. And I thank you for the testimonies that are represented here of the life that you've given. Pray that you do a great work through us, in us, to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.